I said it before, I'll say it again. A poem is never finished, merely abandoned. I'm always tweaking them up. So, John, thanks so much for coming and, and joining us to chat about your brand new memoir, I Want to Be Yours. It's a pleasure, Holly. Thanks for asking me. What is the process of writing longer form writing like that, like for you versus poetry? Well, uh, the way I've done it is with the aid of a, a tape recorder. All my favourite memoir, books of memoirs, they all seem to be going through an, an intermediary, and that intermediary is a recording machine. So it's like, so it's kind of conversational all the way through. You maintain this converse, conversational tone. It really is the most enjoyable way of uh, of doing things, mm. and. Uh, it makes you realise how much you repeat yourself in, uh, <laughs> in everyday life, if nothing else. You you started writing when you were when you were really young, and you had that ambition to be a professional poet from when you were a teenager. Um, why weren't you more discouraged when people said that's not a job? Yeah, I should have been, but it gave me something to prove. I guess mm. uh, I was convinced it. Should, why not? I thought, why not? So other people have done it. You know, there's a long tradition of it. You know, the musical, Stanley Holloway, etc. So, you know, uh, Harry Champion, Gus Ealing. You know, they all did, they all they all did monologues, uh, which ain't a thousand miles away from what I do. So I figured, why not? In uh, in the in the world of entertainment, you know, there is a place for poetry there, as there is in the world of advertising and anywhere else where language is important. Yeah. There's always a place for poetry. You know, people like it, and the kind of poetry I write, of course, is really quite. It was never modern. It was never ever modern. What what I do, what people have been doing, what I do for uh, five thousand years. And do you remember um, what the first verse or part of a poem that you knew off by heart was? Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, it must have been amongst a lot of them, Cause, because that's how I learned poetry at school, Michael Gove style, learn it off by heart. You're 13 years old, this poem was written by a 35-year-old guy 140 years ago. You're not going to understand it, just learn the words, learn the words, and maybe in 40 years it will creep up on you. But right now you're not going to understand it. The cultural reference points in therein will be lost on you, wasted on you. So forget about knowing. You know, it's not a puzzle to be solved. No, what it is, it's a, it's a form of uh, phonetic enjoyment mm. for me. Poetry. If it don't sound good, that's because it ain't any good. So we were always encouraged to uh, to read it aloud uh, uh, in school. So you learn a lot from that, and, that, and you know it, and then uh, that, that, then you get it. It's a, you know, it's music. It's a mm. kind of music uh, made out of language yeah. instead of uh, instruments. And and over the years, you've had. Um a lot of your poetry turned into lyrics and, and things like that, and as, as part of music as well. That's right, fantastic. You're talking about the Arctic Monkeys there, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah wonderful uh, job there. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, a poem is not a song. Uh, if I could write songs, I would write songs. But it, it, it's, a, it's a great engine of wealth, everybody likes a song. <laughs> but poetry is perceived to be a, a more uh, rarefied and minority pursuit. The way Alec, Alex Turner with his prodigious mezzo-baritone has converted that deeply uh, sincere love ode written on the Feast of St Valentine to my present wife back then when in our courting days, directly from my heart to her. He took this poem and by, by adding a few little uh, middle eights here and there, not doing very much by virtue, as I say, of his mezzo-baritone, he uh, made it into a, a powerful uh, love ballad, and uh, by not doing very much, and that's the that's the art of it. I wish you, I wish I'd done it like that all <laughs> along. It's uh, very very fabulous. One of the high points of my life, uh, having him do that. Oh, and so you've you've never been tempted then to to try and have more of your poetry set to music or things oh, like that. Oh, bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> I, it's uh, you know, it's a poem. You know, it's uh, it's it's alive. It's alive mm. for the for the people now. It's dead to me, but it's but now it's got a life of its own. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why that's why it's deeply traumatic getting a book of stuff together and putting anything down. It's like don't put anything in writing. There's a lot of me like that says that don't put anything in writing. You know, because a poem like I said it before, I'll say it again. A poem is never finished, merely abandoned. 
I'm always tweaking them up. You know, they, they they live for me on the road, you know, and to keep it fresh for me, you know, I'm always tweaking them and, you know, not that this, you know what I mean? They, yeah. I never leave, I can't leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's quite traumatic when you've got it in a book. You're <laughs> dead now, it's too late now. Done and <laughs> um, And your style and your look is also something that um, over the years has become particularly iconic. Where did, where was that created? How was that created? Really, I've uh, I've always been uh, I've always been a very careful dresser, ever since uh, 1965. Really, my uh, my taste in clothes has not really altered since then, 1965 specifically, because that was the time when you started getting the clothes we liked in Manchester. You know, American American clothes, Italian American clothes. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, um, since then, that's how I've stuck at it since then. I tell you, an early, it, it, you, nobody's going to be surprised about this, but I used to go to a club in Manchester when I was a teenager. It was called the Oasis. It was a cellar club, and they had all the bands. that Everybody that was anybody played there at a certain level of their trajectory, and so the Who, at the time, of, I can't explain, you know, fabulous record. The Birds, not not the Birds like Mr. Tambourine Man, B Y R D S. The Birds, the English Birds, B I R D S. Uh, and, the, and the most memorable member, Ron Wood. So ever since then, I thought that hair, you know, he, he he's got he's got quite a large nose, but he looks good. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to say, Ron, big, big help in the image department. <laughs> but like but like Ron himself. You know, I've always, I've always worn, you know, three button suits. Yeah, and and did you feel like it became important to the performance and and the and the lifestyle? If you're the only person happening on on a stage, you know, you you have to present a sharp silhouette. After that, you know, it's uh, if you look at like Jerry Lewis in those sort of uh, mid fifties, Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin movies. You know, it, it, Jerry used to get into all sorts of shapes. You know, he was a klutz, and you know, he, he, you know, he, had, he, he, he could really fake that no coordination kind of way of moving about like a schlemiel, you know. <laughs> and for that, you need to have a sharp silhouette, and he, and he had, you know, Jerry had that. And I reckon, I thought, that's good, you know, you can't take your eyes off him. You know, he's a great physical presence, you know, and because he's very angular. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, he doesn't wear anything flowing. He's always got a, a sweater and a pair of Levi's and some basketball sneakers or something like that, you know. Real kind of nerd, proto-nerd. Yeah. But, you know, these shapes, he, these shapes were uh, unforgettable, you know, because of his tight clothes. So I always figured, you know, that was always a plus. You see, even, you know, all of them, in fact, from that great period of American comedy, all of them, you know, Sid Caesar... You know, all of them wore the tight, the tight Ivy League suit. It was the uniform of the solo performer. Yeah, and with um, with your poetry over the years, is there a poem, a verse, a line that still makes you feel the most that you're the most satisfied with? Oh, there's loads of them, but uh, one of my favourites is uh, uh, "I steal a kiss, she takes the piss, we live the life of ignorant bliss." All that and now this, I've fallen in love with my wife. All that and now this, that's my favourite line. <laughs> all that and now this, says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good one. But there's, there's loads of them, I, I, I love my poetry. <laughs> that is a great way to be. And I mean, so many of us love it too. So uh, thanks so much for us. Bless you. For letting us, you know, enjoy it and now find all about your life in this memoir. What a privilege. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Holly. Thanks so much, John.